France by channeling the power of souls brought unprecedented prosperity to his northern kingdom of Boletaria. That is, until the colorless deep fog swept across the land. Boletaria was cut off from the outside world, and those who dared penetrate the deep fog never returned. King Alanth had roused the Old One, the great beast below the Nexus, from its eternal slumber, and that a colorless fog had swept in, unleashing terrible demons. The demons hunt down men to claim their souls. Those who lose their souls lose also their minds. The mad that have the same and also spoke of the enticing power of the demon souls. Each time a demon claims a human soul, the demon's own soul is invigorated by the life force, and the power of a mature demon soul is beyond human imagination. The legend spread quickly. Mighty warriors lured by the possibilities braved the fissure to breach the accursed land. None have returned. The orb of the Twin Fangs. Yet the silent chief. Saint Urbain. Skurva the Wanderer. The sick Saint Astria with her night garb veneered. And Sage Frake the Visionary. The colorless deep fog will increase beyond Boletaria's borders. Humankind faces a slow and steady extinction. The deep fog will eventually swallow all lands near and far. But Boletaria has one final hope. A lone warrior who has braved the baneful fog. Oh, has the land found its savior? Or have the demons found a new slave? Brave soul who fears not death. As they guide you to the fissure. you may lull the old one back to slumber. What's going on guys? Evan the Demon Souls Enthusiast here another Demon Souls gameplay commentary and it has undoubtedly been a long time since I have done a commentary over one of the Souls games. Although that used to be kind of the, the mainstay of the channel. So... A couple of friends of mine, uh, old fans from honestly years ago, requested that since I was one of the lucky folks to get my hands on a PlayStation 5 at launch, uh, special thanks to GameStop for that, that I go ahead and put out a gameplay commentary. So I figured I'd go ahead and do that. Um, but whenever you're going to start a series of commentaries, because unless you're doing sort of a, a one-of type of thing, you wind up having to do a lot of uploads, um, which is representative of a lot of content. So you can get pretty burned out um, if you don't have something that you find really interesting to talk about. Or you wind up skipping segments, or you wind up doing uncommentated runs, you know, so on and so forth. Um, you know, since I started YouTube, oh man, it's probably been six or seven years ago now. Uh, not to say I ever kept up with it, but you get the general idea. Since YouTube was a thing anyway, um, the quality of content has really gone up on the platform. Uh, the people creating content have gotten a lot older, so on and so forth. Um, so I decided, what do I want to do? Well, 
I wanted to sort of go back to this idea of exploring what does it actually mean to be a Souls player, particularly now as the game was sort of, you know, appropriately mainstream. I'm very glad this series went mainstream. Um, I remember buying the original Demon Souls when it came to the United States, of course. I'm a big FromSoft guy, played the Armored Core games and so forth, and figured, let's dive in. So that's kind of how I got exposed to the Souls series, was the, uh, the OG Demon Souls in the States. And I thought it was great. Um, you know, there's an old commentary on YouTube where I talk about some of my thoughts on on the Demon Soul series. It's one of my most viewed videos, although at the time I wasn't feeling all that optimistic um, for a variety of reasons. It's sort of more of a blog, which to a point this is too, when you're going to be talking for you know roughly an hour, give or take, straight gameplay in a non-competitive environment is really not something I think should be post-commentary. It should rather be live commentary, and I'm awful at live commentary, so... Not really what we're going to be going towards. Uh, so I'll probably share my thoughts on the remake. Um, if there's a demand, if people want to know how I feel about the remake, things like that. I'm definitely not a professional video game critic, but I have played a lot of video games and a lot of Souls games. So I definitely have a feel for how this game feels um, relative to the rest of the series and relative to kind of what was promised by Bluepoint, and etc. Um, so... What did we actually decide to do commentary on? You know, I've got some ideas from editorials along the way. Um, for example, I thought about maybe doing like a prescriptive series, uh, which is basically this idea of, you know, there's a lot of choose your own adventure moments in Demon Souls, but a lot of people for, feel more relaxed playing a game or playing any game really, particularly for the first playthrough, and they're told exactly what to do. It's kind of why there's an old industry around strategy guides and stuff before the internet was widely accessible, right? You know, Brady Game Strategy Guide for Final Fantasy. Misses half the secrets, but it'll get you through the game. Um, so that's a series I thought about doing, along with some commentary on different builds and things like that. Not as crazy about the PvP uh, in Demon's Souls as it was in Dark Souls. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, which could probably be, you know, honestly, the the premise for an entirely different video, but not really what we're hoping to do uh, in this video. In this video, we sort of once again talk about what are we doing. Well, I think that the journey from a Dark Souls, for a Dark for Demon Souls, Dark Souls, for a Souls player, if you will, kind of comes in phases, right? I think the first phase when you're a new Souls player or just playing your first Souls game um, is this idea of how do I play this game without just getting absolutely destroyed. How do I do that? You know, when I first picked it up, I was just getting crushed by everything I fought. You know, basic enemies were killing me. Bosses seemed impossible. Uh, this tutorial boss that I'm putting the spanking to right here would have probably killed most players when they try to get through the Nexus. I'm sure there's some players that beat it first try. Uh, the true elite among us, if you will. Uh, but, you know, for most of us, I think that that's the first step, right? It's just getting your first playthrough done, beating bosses, downing bosses, and that's maybe the most enjoyable part of the Souls series. Uh, particularly even when you're playing a new Souls game and you don't know the bosses and stuff yet. Obviously, you know, I've replayed Demons a couple times over the years. Um, my old PlayStation copy. So PlayStation 3, that is, right? Anyway. Uh, some old Demons gameplays. I've got the Platinum Trophy and so on and so forth, so this game is familiar to me for the most part. I think I actually remember this game a lot better than I remember Dark Souls 2. Dark Souls 2 is just completely lost for me. It's a it's a blur. So I'm obviously not going to be doing any sort of commentary on this idea of, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, how, how do I do the things? That's, that's not really going to be part of this channel because it would be disingenuous and phony. So... Then this idea of, here's how you do it to make it easy. That would probably be a playthrough with this idea of a PvE, faith monster, lots of health regeneration, uh, miracles, things like that. Which, if you've never played a Souls game, that's my take on the first build you should do. Uh, you should make sure you unlock all the miracles so that the character gets you that trophy. Because uh, otherwise you wind up having to play through the game three times on the same character. Where if you have a separate build, go through and grab all the miracles... You don't have to worry about that in future playthroughs, and you can focus on getting the spells and the rings and crap like that. Um, it's this idea of also 
And once you're comfortable with the game, you beat all the bosses, it's whatever, you know, feel good. Then I think it really becomes sort of that achievement hunter, um, trophy chasing type of experience, right? Where, you know, I have to make a character that finds all the spells. I have to go through and find all the rings. I've got to do all the world tendency events. Um, so on and so forth. So that is the part of Demons that I actually found to be the most miserable. Both in the remake and in the original, right? Certain things you have to do in this game are just a pain in the butt. I think World Tendency is a, a terrible system. And I think they should have done something to increase its accessibility in the remake. But, you know, once again, what are you going to do? Uh, artistic vision and all that. So, that's not the way it was. I don't really want to do the run to Platinum, because I've already run Platinum on the remake uh, in the original, like I said, and I just, I'm not looking to do it again. Certain tasks are monotonous and dull, not particularly enjoyable. I think the first time you do it, it's kind of fun, but doing it again and again, less so. So finally, I have this idea of what if we sort of do this role or theme based character because there's always optimal builds and the easiest way to play and you know, what feels good you get the idea I think that for me I like that idea I really like the idea of taking community requests um, to do a theme run for a different type of character and old gamer buddy of mine he had suggested like why don't you do some kind of dagger thing you know dagger assassin rogue thing uh, we're still kind of debating this idea of using a shield or not because i like my shields and souls games but you know the idea of a, a rogue like character probably would have a buckler at best for pairing or a pairing dagger and spend the rest of their time rolling around like a madman um, so we're still kind of seeing where we wind up with that but this is that character and so when i describe the the traditional role play character you know what are you trying to do well you know for me that means i want a build that is functional right it doesn't have to be entirely min max it doesn't have to be the the top of its class but that said i i don't want to play a build that just is artificially designed to suck right i think that makes the enemies take longer to kill i think it punishes you for slight mistakes and if you're in the mood for just sort of challenging yourself I don't know, why not take up speed running or 100% run, something like that. Uh, I do want gaming to be relaxing still for me, and that's the type of stress I'm just not into. So for me, a roleplay theme build can't just be absolute garbage. It can't be super gimmicky like, oh, uh, you know, we're going to do a pacifist run or something like that, you know, zero equip run. There's some really cool challenge type runs on the YouTubes um, that people stream to, of course, on Twitch, but... I'm, I'm not feeling any of that, right? So I'm going to try to do a functional theme character um, that at least tries to stick to what we're doing. All right. So what does that look like for me? So I am thinking that I want to do this daggers and bow things, right? So obviously that's way pop to soul, you know, with my deluxe pay to win stuff there, my, my stash. We want to go you know, get a dagger immediately from the first shop. I think that should be part of this this theme build, right? Is you should be trying to feel like you're playing your theme as soon as you can. So if you're going to be a knight, you know, grab a long sword uh, or a spear, or whatever your knight thinks you would specialize in. Barbarian club or whatever you think stereotypically that build would do. Um, you know, I want to be Sephiroth, man. All right, Sephiroth. All right, Final Fantasy guy. Uh, I thought the remaster of that sucked. All right, so you're going to what? Go out and grab. You know, katana. You get the idea. But you want to get online early. So you probably don't want to make the final build um, gated behind three-fourths of the game's content. Because unless you're going to do the whole run in New Game Plus, and I think Demons is at its most fun in regular New Game, so that's out for me, you've got to uh, you know, get online sooner than that. Uh, so that's, that's an important, I think, choice when your weapons, at the same time, you want to be able to sort of find things as the game progresses to you, so you have some sense of progression. At least that's how I want to do it. Um, so, daggers and bows actually work pretty well for this, because as you think about your build, there are, you know, of course, the standard weapon upgrade paths, but there are also slight dagger upgrades, 
I support magic upgrades, so on and so forth. And I think that that's exactly what I'm looking for, right? Um, so that said, what is this actually going to look like in the end? Well, not 100% sure yet, but we are going to be going in on a hidden secret dagger, a uh, hidden dagger. I can't remember if it's hidden or secret dagger, but one of those two. Uh, we're going to go in for that. We're going to go in for the lava bow. We're going to go in for some decent arrows, and we're just going to use those to take down bosses. So it admittedly won't be the, the highest skill thing we've ever seen, but it's probably more skillful than the community preference right now, which is to run around and firestorm all the bosses for instant kills, which definitely was my way to get platinum. Uh, once again, if you're trying to speed run this game for your platinum trophy, I think that you definitely pick um, a mage. You go max out the firestorm type equipment uh, or homing soul mass. Both of those are amazing, and you just clear bosses first or second try. Okay. As for this character, so we already know we're going in on Secret Dagger, we're going in on Lava Bow. What are we going to do for our stats? Well, that's where it gets interesting. So, when we first start this run, I'm going to, in my opinion, set it as a functional PvP build. Uh, starting class should definitely be a Royalty or a Temple Knight. Sure, neither is historically on theme with what we're doing, but... Unfortunately, the starting classes in demons tend to not be very balanced. Uh, a lot of the games have sort of the quote-unquote optimal stat distribution, but demons, a bunch of characters have wasted points into luck. So unless you're going to a blue blood sword build, so you can actually profit from points into luck, it's a non-starter, right? You're probably going to spend your time as a temple knight or as a mage. Uh, excuse me, a royalty. Don't pick magician. Pick royalty over magician uh, in almost all cases. Okay, so stat-wise, we are going to go for Strength at 14, Dexterity at 16, Faith at 16, Intelligence at 13, which, as a Temple Knight would put us at Soul Level 16, I think Royalty saves a point and gets to go in at Soul Level 15, but I'd rather play Temple Knight um, for the slightly more efficient early game. And also the fact that I just like having those extra points in the vitality and endurance at the time the build sort of reaches its low-level PvP. Also, if you want to PvP in this game, there aren't a whole lot of people running around at the soul level 120. For those of you who are new to this Demon Souls, Dark Souls PvP system, basically, unless you're summoning people in to fight you, people are going to invade you if you're in human form outside the Nexus. You can't be invaded if you're... And you're in soul form, you're a ghost, you're dead. Okay. So, most players are still low level or run around low level or just aren't running around in body form because they don't want to be invaded. Or uh, they're going to plug pull them and you do invade. That can't really uh, be fixed, the plug pulling. And I, for the record, there's probably a time where I would have scorned those players, right? Like, what's your deal? Why can't you, why are you plug pulling? Why you got to fight? Why can't you fight, rather? And I've really changed my perspective on that um, with time. So now is as good a time as any to sort of share my thoughts um, on the PvP community in Souls games. Uh, of course, this community, I might add, is a very comes from a very non-judgmental place. These are video games. Play in a way that makes you happy, right? Play for fun. Play for joy. So on and so forth. So if invading is what's fun for you, as it is fun for me, I encourage you to do so uh, and apologize to no one. If playing like a scumbag is fun for you, provided you're not hacking or just outright busting the game with the now patch luck glitch, uh, as, as long as you're not doing something that just sort of blatantly violates the rules of the game, and I think I think you're good to go. Like, let's, let's roll, right? It's definitely a mechanic built into the game. It's not abusive, so on and so forth. That said, once again, as we are coming from a non-judgmental place, I am going to say that the Souls community for PvP, outside of fight clubs and stuff like that, uh, kind of silly. So, 
of having been the guy that does this and been the guy that experiences this and been the guy that watches this on Twitch. Keeping your soul level low and getting max upgrade weapons or optimizing a low PvP soul level PvP build, that's all well and good. And I actually think it's really fun, particularly when you run into somebody that did the same thing. Uh, then you get a nice, quick, low soul level PvP duel. But that's typically not what happens. Typically you run into somebody, either a veteran player who's just playing a body form and trying to get through the game, or worse yet, you run into uh, someone who's actually new to the game and doesn't know what's going on. And it's usually not like an honest fight, right? It's not like you show up with gear sort of appropriate to that soul level. No, you're probably going to show up with you know, an adjudicator shield with max regen stacked uh, with a parry knuckles of some kind, uh, parry dagger, heater shield, whatever. Also, of course, Max, Knuckles will probably be blessed with Crescent or Blast to give you HP or MP regen right on your parry tool there, if you will. And you're going to have a plus five dragon weapon or a northern regalia. And that just busts the game um, at low level PvP. And if you are new to Demon Souls, just kind of came across this video, don't worry. All of this will become bleh, dead. All of this stuff will become known to you eventually. This will all be kind of commonplace uh, for these terms for you to explore. But suffice it to say, I'm just sort of listing off kind of the early game super cheese. And of course, Demon Souls also has the original troll weapon, which is the scraping spear. So this is a PSA for vets and new players alike. Um, if you are a guy invading folks with a scraping spear to break all their gear and grief, I mean, good for you. Like, there's nothing I can say that's going to sort of change your perspective on the right. You knew what you were doing when you did it, and, and that's chill. You know who you are. You know what you're doing. Once again, I'm cool with it, but if you are a new player and you see somebody who's invading you and they have a spear, uh, my advice would be Google a picture of a scraping spear so you kind of know what one looks like. The scraping spear breaks your items. Uh, it degrades your weapons, it degrades your armor, and that's not a good time. Because you'll have a repair bill of thousands of souls. Now, armor is admittedly not that important in Souls games. Uh, rolling and blocking and parrying correctly is far more important, but it's still really unfortunate to have the armor set that you like using completely busted. Now you have to go farm several thousand souls, uh, which once you're into the game isn't going to be a big deal to you. But early on, it's it's a nightmare, right? You're like, that's, you know, four or five levels. I keep dying. This is really putting me back. All right. So if you see a scraping spear guy and you don't want to disconnect and you want to, you know, you want to have the soul's experience, which I think is to fight the invader and probably lose. I think that very much is the soul experience. Um, I would strongly encourage you as a player to just take off all your armor. Um, armor adds so little effective HP in the PvP environment anyway. That it's just not worth the repair bill. It's not worth the damage on your armor. Just strip down, you know, keep your weapon out maybe, uh, and have a good fight. I mean, maybe even fist fight it, just so at least you can have the experience. I don't know. I definitely wouldn't leave my armor on versus a min-maxed low-level invasion build who's gonna break all my stuff. That's just silly. I don't think I'd plug pull either, but... I'd split the difference there, not giving the satisfaction of breaking my gear. So, a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, quickly, touching back on this stat distribution idea. The reason you want 16 faith on essentially every build in Demon Souls is that lets you get second chance. So, second chance is if your character is killed by quote-unquote lethal damage, right? Doesn't work if you fall off something, but... You won't actually die. You'll revive with a small fraction of your HP. Uh, more than one HP, uh, as it has better than its later incarnations uh, in other Souls games. Uh, it's, the second chance is effectively so good that every build is going to run it. You know, this is way better than Tears of Denial and almost considered a must for most builds. And so, Demon Souls, of course, magic works a little differently. In Dark Souls... Um, 
You know, Dark Souls was one of those games where you know I get five casts between bonfires. Well, this game obviously has a blue bar, an MP bar, um, and requires slots to equip magic, if you will. So to equip magic um, for second chance, you need two faith slots, two miracle slots, rather, because second chance takes two miracle slots. You get the idea. Okay, so 16 faith is the break point, if you will, for two miracle slots, which is just too good. Every build is ultimately going to wind up with 16 faith, whether optimized or just casual, uh, unless the player just doesn't want to use second chance. I mean, there's a few things that you can really spend your points on that aren't worth it. Um, so that's why we have 16 there. It also unlocks a lot of really neat build opportunities. Um, for example, hyper mode, which is this idea of there are items that get tons and tons of damage bonuses if you're really low HP. This would be one of the builds that would actually presumably benefit from that in the right circumstances. So, to make that happen, we are definitely going for second chance uh, as part of this build. That'll be the Miracle Spell slot. And also, I think it's on theme, for me at least. I've always considered the Dagger Rogue Evasion class kind of that good saving throw on your dice rolls, right? Really likely... Uh, not to go down, difficult to kill. So, I like it. I think it's on theme. I think it's functional. Plus, from a convenience perspective in the PvE environment, you know, there's some non-immersion breaking things that are nice to have. Like, the Heal Miracle early game is kind of neat to save on some grass. Um, as is the Evacuation Miracle. Uh, early on, once again, to be able to warp back to the Nexus without dying or having to to run to an Archstone, right? Because this game doesn't have bonfires, so you're going to have to finish the stage or run back to the beginning. There is no you know, no other way out. There's usually shortcuts to connect parts of the level, but you know, it can be quite a hike. And if you're planning to farm without throwing your life away, you know, you're very much, very much going to find evacuation to be handy. Um, by no means necessary, but... I like it on pretty much all my builds. I think I get second chance on essentially every build I play. So with that said, there just isn't a reason not to get an early evacuation point, which is part of the character creation process for pretty much everything I do. Now, that said, once we you know, sort of set up the PvP build, because that will be the first part of these videos, is getting our basic gear, and then... Maybe we'll do a couple invasions, a uh, little PvP environment stuff to sort of demonstrate that it's a viable low-level invasion build. Which I think will be a lot of fun, actually. You know, we have a couple invasions with a bow and a dagger. Um, you know, we won't use dragon weapons either. We'll use, you know, an actual, like, probably crescent dagger or something like that. We'll definitely be overgeared for the area, which will be invading. But I think it will still be fun, and it won't be grief-tastic. Not that I'd necessarily mind griefing, I just choose not to. Also, quick aside, for those of you that have, like, low soul-level old monk builds of, like, maxed out regen gear, once again, with, like, scraping spear or dragon weapons, or you're just going to firestorm the guy when he walks through the fog gate, you know, you know who you are. Come on, folks. Uh, that's going to probably scare people right out of actually doing that fight online. If you want to do an old monk actual character, do something cool. Do something original. Do something fun. That's my take. Once again, no judgment. People can play how they want, but I think we have a much more enjoyable roleplay-ish old monk fight um, if people did more than just like the ultra cheese kill the host builds. For those of you once again who are new and don't know what I'm referencing, there is a world boss... Uh, in Demon Souls, where if you are playing online, you will almost certainly wind up PvPing another player, which I highly recommend doing, right? Sure, it can be scary. It is probably much harder than most other bosses, uh, especially if you get a dedicated griefer or a high-skilled PvP there, or just an average player will probably be challenging if you're new to PvP, but it's, it's really a neat experience. The lore behind it is awesome. You gotta do it at least once. That's my take anyway. When I first played Demon Souls back when this game was new and I got the old monk fight sort of versus another online player, I, my mind was blown, right? Because it was such a weird way to have multiplayer. We're all in our own worlds and f 
I'm getting people forcibly invading my world. I'm inviting players into my world to help me. To the whole Souls experience, uh, one of them being a boss. That was sweet. Uh, it's one of my favorite mechanics. And so, you know, I hope eventually players who are building specifically to be that world boss for other players do something a little bit more than come up with the most cheesy, difficult to beat, frustrating thing kind of in the universe. Or at least bring uh, tier gear. I always thought that was a great idea too, right? What if we show up with gear complete to take on, you know, the whole Phantom Army, right? The Phantom Menace, two blues and all that. And we equip that when we need it, as opposed to showing up with the max stuff and beating on some host who has like a plus four weapon and is just trying to Try to have his soul's experience. Yeah, prepare to die, right? Okay. So, what is our actual course sort of through the demon soul's experience here? What are we what are we trying to do? Well, the course to me should be uh, some of which of course is going to be captured in this video. Although right now we have no deviations available. You know, we're in the first zone. All we can do is fight through Phalanx, that way the Arch Stones get opened. So, once we have a little agency over our lives, what what should be our route of progression? Well, once Phalanx goes down and all the Arch Stones are opened, I think the most sensible thing for a character like this to do, and arguably for almost any character to do, is go to Arch Stone 4-1. That way we can get an early game Crescent Falchion. That way we can get an early game Regenerator Ring. That way we can take down a boss that's essentially free um, and use those souls to, to really ease into the early game a little bit. I think that that is the optimal progression path for both returning veteran players and new players alike. Because if you are new, uh, and this will be demonstrated later in this video, Kind of the classic Demon Soul start for a really powerful weapon early game, along with some really powerful and helpful rings early game. It isn't particularly game breaking because you're still going to die. In this game, even if you have the optimal gear in PvP, PvE, if if you screw up versus a boss real bad, you're just going to die, and that's kind of the charm of the game, right? You can definitely overlevel yourself, you can definitely overgear yourself, and all that helps a lot. But if you're just tanking hits and not putting out damage on the boss, you know, it's it's kind of whatever. You're going to die anyway. So I think the 4-1 start is really what all players should do. Uh, of course, the caveat, unless they just don't enjoy it, at which point, you know, why why discuss it further, right? You already kind of kind of know your way. Um, now, once we knock out this whole concept of for one, you know, I recommend actually killing the Adjudicator. And we'll get a Crescent Falchion. That will actually let us DPS down enemies in areas that would probably be a real pain in the butt for us to normally do early game, right? And I think that is honestly the way to do it because why make it harder than it necessarily needs to be even if you're trying to roleplay a character? I mean... We're only using this temporarily until we can go get our our preferred weapon, which in this case is in World 3-1, which is why I said to help us with enemies in 3-1. So 4-1, Crescent Falchion, early game souls, great, awesome. Then from there, we're going to go 3-1, get a secret dagger. Then I think we're going to start farming upgrade materials um, in the first couple arch stones. We're going to start farming upgrade materials and the second arch stone and get it as high as we can. Because, uh, yeah, that's our in-game weapon. And there's no reason not to get it as high as we can, as early as we can. So that's that's the path, I think, for me. The next thing we're going to want to do is, you know, go in on the Lava Bow. Because having a ranged option is kind of one of the secrets, I think, to a lot of the Souls games that really gets missed. And I think about that, I'm guilty of that too. I didn't recognize kind of 
when I first played through this game and still when I continue to play Souls games, everyone thinks of their ranged option as magic, which I, you know, I would maintain probably is the the best ranged option. Miracles are magic in all the Souls games. If you really want to focus on range, you know, why not be a, a mage or a miracle, lightning spear thrower type of thing? Which, P.S., if you want to do offensive miracle casting, you don't want to be in miracles in this game. Miracles is all support stuff. Uh, with the exception of God's Wrath, which is a huge AoE that is funny in PvP, occasionally useful in PvP, PvE, but mostly trash relative to spells. Uh, people sort of neglect this idea of bows, but bows are actually, uh, particularly in demons, one of the most efficient ways to farm early game levels in souls, so that's cool. They're actually incredibly useful versus most enemies and bosses, and the lava bow being in this game, which is a bow that doesn't require a tremendous stat investment and it doesn't require farming of rare upgrade materials, really gives most character classes access to really awesome ranged weapon early on. And so for me, for my money, that's what all players should focus on getting early game is a good ranged weapon. Um, I recommend a lava bow if you're not going to be specializing in dexterity for pretty much all builds build it it's great absolutely love it unless you're a ranged character then obviously you don't need to and we'll see this later once i actually have a bow right now we're too early in the game for me to have a bow or really anything else but <laughs> forgot this guy one of my two deaths here in the starting zone it's like why is he still here oh right i died a couple times so knocked him out real quick now we get to do phalanx which I am proud to announce the first time I played Demon Souls. I can confirm I downed this boss without a death. Mainly because he is weak to fire and fire bombs make it easy. Okay, so what is the strategy for Phalanx? Strategy for Phalanx, and of course there are better ways to do what I'm doing. Uh, Speedrunners of course have this optimized throwing pattern and stuff. It's just to chuck fire bombs at him and kill uh, as many of his phalanx minions as possible. The boss is actually the giant fat blob in the middle of the spearmen, but I like to go around and kill all the little ones first. So you'll see me resin my weapon here. This basically applies fire to my attack. So now I can slash from the front side and actually get some damage. I can slash from the back side and get some damage. Now the overall premise is fire is the way to go. So throwing fire bombs at him to splash a couple of the things down, enchanting your weapon with resin, pine resin, the same thing. Once you've killed enough of the things you feel comfortable going for the giant blob in the middle, or you're like me and you want all the little things done, because uh, actually, they also do uh, drop sharp stones too. I usually want the upgrade stones, so I figure I might as well down them all anyway. Um, that's really the boss. It's basically free. It's a good little tutorial though on problem solving. Most Souls bosses, and I think Demon Souls in particular, most of the bosses are more of, there's a gimmick that makes them incredibly easy, which I think was deliberate on the developer's um, part. It's sort of a problem-solving exercise, which I really like uh, as a game design. I think later Souls games, while that pattern continued, did become slightly more mechanically challenging, which was also good. So for me, once again, as someone who's played all the Souls games, and you know Bloodborne, so Souls-like games, so on and so forth, Soulsborne. I gotta tell you, I think in terms of progression as a series, this this series really, really nailed it. So your first game is an amazing entry um, that gets you on the map, it gets players loyal, players like me that are way, way into it, and then you know it, it keeps improving upon itself. So, kind of my overall thoughts on the Soul series in a nutshell here as we finish off a completely defenseless boss here. So, Demon Souls, kind of the trendy one, gets you on the map, fun, but fundamentally has a lot of weird mechanical choices that, while innovative and interesting, don't really age well, aren't necessarily that enjoyable to begin with. Uh, then you have Dark Souls, which... The original Dark Souls, I think, is the one that gets all of Demon Souls right, 
Um, while it's still imperfect, of course, it's you know it makes your armor choices way more relevant. It adds the bonfire system, which I thought was a lot cooler um, than kind of what we're doing here in Balataria and Demon Souls. It's got really epic boss fights, um, a, a better world in my opinion. So Dark Souls, man, the flawed masterpiece. So where do we go from there? Okay, then you go into the land of Dark Souls 2. Right, Dark Souls 2 is weird. It's got a whole bunch of weird stat allocation choices that kind of kind of messes with your head a little bit. It's got the incredibly controversial adaptability or a stat that you know impacts your rolling frames, which I was never a huge fan on unless we just accepted we were going to max it. Um, and then Dark Souls 2, of course, has the really odd level design, the super slow Sunny D Estus Chug. Dark Souls 2 is just weird, man. And, like, the level layout doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense if you actually look at it on, like, a map where you'll take an elevator to go way up in the sky and wind up at, like, a lava castle that looks like it's down in the earth. You're like, how do these areas conjoin? So you start to, like, Dark Souls 2 is, like, really flawed, right? It just doesn't feel as good as the original Dark Souls. But then you start to dig in a little bit, and suddenly you realize that it's, it's trying to do kind of its own thing, right? Instead of just, hey, this is Dark Souls 1 improved. It's like, you know, this is Dark Souls 2, man. It's weird. It's it's wonky. It's got way more weapon variety. It's got some really awesome weapons. It's got peculiar bosses, which bosses was probably not the high point in that game. Then it has these DLCs. And the DLCs in Dark Souls 2, in my opinion, are awesome. You know, they're fairly lengthy. They're fun. They're different. Then if you actually get into the PvP of Dark Souls 2, like probably the best weapon variety, uh, different sort of combat styles of any of the Souls games. And Senior is like, man, maybe Dark Souls 2 is the the best game in the series. And then you slow down and really think about it for a bit, and you're like, ah, uh, not really, because it was, once again, kind of jacked up and weird. And then... You know, maybe insult to injury in the Dark Souls 2 world is soul memory, which, you know, forces your level to continually increase, and it sucks. Um, and that's what's up. Then you go into Dark Souls 3, which Dark Souls 3, for my hot take, is literally Dark Souls 1, only more accessible. It's refined in a lot of ways. It's smoother, fantastic. Um... But probably pretty crappy PvP when you really, really, really get down to it. So Dark Souls 2 probably did PvP better than Dark Souls 1. That might be a little generous. But outside of some weird mechanical choices like Soul Memory, Dark Souls 2 was actually really awesome. The Dark Souls 3 comes around. Awesome PvE. Awesome DLC kind of spammy dull pvp get ready for the haters in the comments you're new al i'm, I'm definitely not the strongest pvp in the souls community but i'm also not inept right like i've got hundreds of hours in each souls game pvp and so I, I, to a point that the r1 brigade of just mashing r1 which ps is a thing in demon souls just basically spamming light attacks and stun locking your way to victory is very much a thing in dark souls 3 and it is very much a thing in demons. So, once again, long commentary on the evolution of the Souls game. Then you have Bloodborne. Bloodborne's out doing its own thing with guns and chalice dungeons and, you know, being Lovecraftian and having blood everywhere and having this more aggressive paced idea, right? Which, what I like about Bloodborne, I think, when I look at it, how it sits in this series, because I played it actually the least out of anything in the Souls game. But I love the idea that Dark Souls, for my money, really rewarded a slower, methodical, shielding, rolling, choose your openings. Bloodborne still had that that piece, but it definitely rewards you to be aggressive. The enemy patterns were set up in such a way as you should be going in. You know, you get HP back for hitting them. Uh, and that's that's cool. If there's any takeaway I can make on the history of the Souls games as me as a player and my preferences, I think I would say 
I like bonfires. I like MP bars. I very much dislike healing items that are limited. So Demon Souls and Bloodborne, the whole vial system, blood vials and Bloodborne. Um, in Demon Souls, we have this grass. I, I loathe it. I absolutely loathe that system. I hate the fact that when you're new, you're always scrambling to find those grass. And then once you're good at the game, basically having unlimited heals really trivializes um, a lot of the game. And at least for demons. For Bloodborne, I don't... Uh, blood vials just... Farming blood vials just sucked. You know, I'm a big believer in, you know, set a finite number of heals every time you spawn in, like the Estus Flask. Let it be refreshed. Cool. Leave it at that. This game is really hilarious. If you ever feel like you're... You're stuck in demons, I would advise you to just go farm the best grass and chug grass. You know, if you have enough HP and you chug grass, you'll really be fine for most of the fights, even if you only get a couple hits in. Okay. So this is the 4-1 cheese, right? This is where we go get an amazing weapon right at the onset of the game. You'll see me kind of overthinking these fights. So, a couple things about the skeletons here. They are weak to blunt damage. So if you have a slashing weapon, which is most swords, if you don't have a mace or a club or a halberd or something like that, they don't really take a whole lot of damage because they've got a pretty good HP versus slash. But your fists are blunt. So actually, before you get a functional weapon to fight these guys, or even an upgraded slashing weapon, Stripping all your weapons off and just going, quote-unquote, hand-to-hand is really the way to go. You know, hold the shield up in front of you when they roll in. Circle behind. Pow-pow right in the back. They start to stand up. Spam the R1. Bring them down. It's the easiest way to kill the skeletons. Now, once you get comfortable, you can catch them on the parry on the roll-in. Uh, and Expedite the process, but when you're sort of not used to their timings. I'm actually not slashing. You're new to this area, and you're just trying to come here and do the the old 4-1 cheese, which most new players and vets are now aware of. But, you know, the first time you're seeing it is here on this video, and you're like, man, I just want to do this cheese thing. You know, I want to get past this man's ramblings and just go do the thing. Well, take off your weapon, bring out your fists, put out a 100% physical resistance shield, and punch your way through these guys. Don't do that. So I decided to be cheeky and try to get a parry there because you play enough Souls games for a while and you're like, man, I want a style. Um, which, really not helpful. So obviously could have edited back to the respawn uh, like in the previous areas, but decided to leave this one in just to demonstrate really how easy it is to do this if you don't try to style. That's definitely a trap for me in the Souls games is I've been playing them for so long I, I feel like I'm under some obligation to make it look good, you know? But sometimes it's just easier just to kind of do what you know. Thankfully also we died pretty early in the level. I'm playing cautiously here because I don't want to lose my souls. Because, frankly, that is one thing that would actually disrupt the video making is if I lost all my souls um, and weren't, was not able to recover them. Because I use um, close to the, the souls you'll receive for killing the Adjudicator boss and kind of cleaning out the parts of the area you should clean out um, to buy the Evacuation Miracle, which is 20k souls. The earlier you get it, the more it sort of pays off both in time and souls. So I'm a big fan of honestly getting it early. Uh, evacuation is also part of my quote-unquote quick no-risk soul farming method, which isn't really a me thing. I Most players in Demon Souls are aware of it at this point, but I will demonstrate it sort of a little bit later um, for the fast, easy souls. Which, 
now that I think about it, I'm going to take a quick note here. That might be another idea for for a Souls game, the Ego Xeno route uh, for quick levels and easy fun. So through the first fog gate, immediately make a left, trip the switch, run into the wall, or hold your shield up. Either works. And then ignore me getting a little bit lost here. You just want to walk out that door that I was just looking at. There we go. I realized I got turned around. Black skeleton drops pure blade stones. Is not worth farming at this juncture in your career. Run past. In fact, he's really not worth farming ever, in my opinion. So, you'll see we got a Crescent Falchion. This right here, this is the early game Maximum Cheeserino. So, what does Crescent mean? So, Crescent is now scaling off our Intelligence stat. Um, to make a weapon Crescent, you have to upgrade a weapon to a certain point where the upgrade path will open. So, my Intelligence stat is actually pretty trash. You'll see me trying to parry again and looking really bad. <laughs> So, even though my intelligence stat is bad, see me getting that free heal because I chose Temple Knight. Say so everyone says royalty is the way to go, but I swear Temple Knight is what you want. Better starting weapons, better shield, heals great. That was a good soul arrow. Um, so, once again, you'll see me checking my stats here. Despite not having a lot of uh, the stats that scale off Crescent weapons. It's still pretty good. Honestly. There's a lot more damage you're going to sort of naturally find unless you go and farm a Dragon weapon in 2-1. And this is much easier to get than any weapon in World 2. So just grab that quick and go from there. Okay, so here's the skip. You can roll over this wall. Takes a couple tries. Takes practice. The golden rule here is don't think it got patched out. Don't be frustrated. You just roll right onto the wall and jump over. There's a couple skips like that in Demon Souls, and they are actually pretty fun. The only thing that can hold you back is not having fast roll, so you know, be under 50% equip load, or if you're paranoid, just strip off all your armor and run around in your underwear. Uh, you should be able to roll over with practice. Very common skip gets you the regeneration ring, which early game will sort of reduce your reliance on grass, right? You're just going to sort of heal naturally while walking around. Um, every couple seconds, your HP will rise. And it's just a really nifty thing to have. Um, it beats having to chug grass for all your little wounds and stuff. So I tend to wear this ring almost all the time in early game. Uh, unless you're all in on sort of regeneration, it's probably not an in-game ring in my opinion, unless you've got other regeneration to go with it. So you just have a regeneration tank, uh, which is probably, the, in my opinion, the easiest PvE build next to Firestorm spam, right? I apologize, my phone's going off in the background. I'm gonna mute that, get that taken care of. Okay. So those flying guys, if you just stay moving, they'll rarely hit you, slash never hit you. You can also equip the thief ring and they just won't see you. So what's interesting here real quick is since we did a skip, right? We can't leave the level naturally. If we don't wanna fight the boss and we wanna get out of here, we're just gonna have to die. Because the route we took essentially made it so we're on the wrong side of the fog gates you walk through. And you can't walk through them on the wrong side. Also, hilariously, if you're in human form and you get invaded with the skip, and the phantom spawns in on the wrong side of the fog wall, he can't open it. So he is not going to be able to actually kill your character. So if you really want to... You can stand around and make that phantom suicide himself, which will make him lose a soul level. Uh, because when invading phantoms die to environmental hazards, they lose a soul level, which probably shouldn't be a thing. Uh, as in the soul level lost for failed invasions to the environment. I don't know why that is that way, but it is. Okay, so Adjudicator. Super free boss. Also, don't do R2. I am quite confident R1 is quicker. Your light attack with the Falchion. Two ways to do Adjudicator. If you are a mage, have tons of firebombs, have a decent bow, or just have a lot of patience, 
you can kill him by shooting the birdie uh, from the ground. You can either stand up on the platforms and dodge the tongue and arrow him to death up there, hit him with fireballs, you get the idea. Or you can do the more common method, uh, sort of smack away at that giant meat cleaver in his side. If you see it, you'll see the flesh jiggle, blood will come out. Just kind of pound away at it for a bit. I have a hard time hitting it because of the diagonal attacks and not really having the exact hit point memorized. If you have the right build, it's so much quicker to do it with a ranged character, but if you're like me, and this is the second boss you're doing after Phalanx, and you're just here for some quick souls and a easy escape, you know, whacking the, whacking the sword here is probably the easiest way to do it. As for not getting yourself killed, there is literally nothing to it. If you stand up in his grill, you know, right up on the fat belly there, all he gonna do is that long sweep of the meat cleaver along the ground, a butcher's blade there. So just stay right up against him, smacking on the blade that's kind of impaled on him there until he goes down, then hit the bird. Which, lore-wise, I think this is a neat boss, right? You have this jacked up, totally horrific abomination and this little cute birdie on top screeching at you. Uh, you know, basically controlling the adjudicator, if you will. So, a little bit tedious, but very low risk. Hack away at the giant blade in the monster's side. And around and around we go. Ring around the rosy. Dodging the slash. This is what I do for, like I said, all my new characters. Straight to adjudicator for some quick souls. So the one way you can actually die in this fight, in my opinion, is to get stuck. So as you can see, he kind of gets, at least when I fight him because of my positioning, he gets kind of trapped up against the fog door here, this alcove on my right, and the staircase. And since I get stuck, I run into problems where I don't have anywhere to roll, I don't have anywhere to run, and I get killed. Now thankfully when he swings his arm, that rotates his body enough you can usually slip by. Sometimes I get stressed out and try to bait him out of the corner a little bit by standing further away. Would not recommend doing this. It's actually more dangerous because if you mistime your roll or you can't get far enough away, he might one-shot you, particularly if you're a royalty and don't have points in vitality yet. One more cycle ought to get it here. And he will actually go down. Which will take us close to the end of the video, which... This is a great time to put out there that um, you know, this is not my full-time job. It's not really a job at all. I do this for fun. Um, you know, I full-time work in the higher education system in the United States. I'm the director of a department. Um, and so, that said, you know, I am not looking to make this a job, but at the same time, you know, helpful feedback, thumbs up, thumbs down, ratings, comments. I actually get a lot out of that stuff because when you don't actually have that many viewers, the few comments you get are the only feedback you receive unless you're like me and you beg your gamer friends to watch your stuff and be like, please watch my sad Demon Souls video. So that is a long rant to say. Um, no need to promote the channel, but I would very much appreciate any feedback you can give me about what you'd like to see what you liked about this video, what sucked, and etc. <laughs> I do kind of like the finish there. I obviously jacked up my cycles, and I didn't want to go through the whole, you know, knock them to his belly one more time, uh, just, uh, just to finish him off. So, gave him that little firebomb kiss there at the end. So, back to the Nexus. Um, now, we've immediately returned to this area, because there is a merchant... Grave Roger Bilge can be rescued once the boss is down. And I'm looking to do that honestly right away. So if you run past the start of the level, straight ahead, past the giant demon into the hole in the floor, there's no need to kill the tutorial boss again. Unless you just want the souls, but you might as well do it later. So come down here. You'll see me 
carefully retreating because I pulled both. Um, it's a narrow space, so I don't have a spear or a long sword to stab straight, so I'm I'm concerned my weapon's going to ricochet off one of the walls. And I'm going to get stuck there in like a ricochet pattern and get a, basically gang-banged by these skeletons and killed. So playing pretty conservatively here. Circle behind. Get the backstab. Love the ragdoll physics on that body. You know, I kicked him off a hill and he somersaulted. There's other items you can find in this world, but I'm not that worried about getting them at this stage in the character's life cycle. Uh, right now, we just want to use the key we obtained earlier to come into here and rescue the grave robber here. Uh, he has important stuff for this build. He sells great arrows uh, later on, so he is a must-rescue merchant. I also wind up buying a longbow here, so I have an early game ranged option. This is probably a waste of souls. If you are watching this at home, I would strongly encourage you not to do this. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna do is, um, this is where I was like, do I really wanna buy this bow? Then I did. Do not buy this bow. You'll find bows that you can upgrade for a lava bow. Don't do this. I also purchased Evacuate in the Nexus, which you can do as well. So thanks everyone for watching. I'll see you all next time, and I hope you enjoyed.